Hello, Mr. Chakrabarty. Hello there. Hi. Pleasure to meet you. And you. So we heard you're coming to Korea, so we came here to meet you. That's very kind of you. I'm very glad to be back in Korea. This is not your first time then? Not at all, no. I think this is about my fifth time as president of EBID to be in Korea. I've been here before that as well. Really good to be back. And you have a presence here, I hear? Indeed we do. One of the things we've been trying to do is really ramp up our business development efforts, reaching out to Korean companies, investors, Korean banks. And we thought it was much more efficient to hire a consultant who's based here in Seoul, here in this space behind me, which has been kindly given to us by Kexim Bank, a good partner of ours. And that consultant, he has spends all his time trying to find companies who will work with EBID in our projects in our 38 countries of operation. And it's been very successful so far. Great, great. So should we move over to carry on our conversation? Let's do that. Thank you for meeting with us today. Um, I don't think many people are familiar with the EBRD. Um, can you explain what the bank does? In short, we're a multilateral development bank. So everyone I'm sure has heard of the Asian Development Bank or the World Bank. Similarly, we're also a bank that's set up by a number of governments. Now we have some 71 shareholders, 69 of those are governments and two international organizations. And EBRD was created back in 1991 with a very specific mandate to try and help the countries of Central and Eastern Europe, the former Soviet Union, move towards market economies as they moved away from communism and the command economy. So we were very focused and have always been very focused on the private sector and the private sector development. And really the transition of these economies from command economies to actual market economies. And we are now operating in some 38 countries. Uh, originally, as I said, in Eastern Europe and former Soviet Union. But because we were so successful, we've expanded the geographical remit of the organization. We now operate from uh, Morocco, on the Atlantic Ocean, all the way to Mongolia, and from the north to the south, from Estonia to Egypt. Uh, so we're actually in three continents now, Africa, Europe, and Asia. How do you become a member country of the EBRD? Initially, um, when the EBRD was set up, uh, a constitution was drafted which uh, made it very clear that all the European countries would automatically be members and the non-European countries you had to be a member of the IMF mm -hmm. to become a member. So Korea was one of the founding shareholders of EBRD and uh, then uh, after that you have to, the members are divided into two groups if you like. Those which are uh, non-recipients, they're not asking for EBRD to invest in their country and those who are recipients who are receiving EBRD investments into their countries. And that depends really on how far advanced they are in the transition to a market economy. So we have now 38 countries that are recipients of EBRD investments. Right. What's the level of Korea's contribution at the bank? First of all, Korea has a seat on our board. It, uh, it alternates with Australia. It's a part of a constituency which has Korea, Australia, New Zealand, and Egypt mm -hmm. in it. But Korea is also a really rather large donor to the bank. It provides yeah. donor financing, grant financing for a number of areas, uh, and, you know, which it has done for many years. And it also is a major source of business opportunities for EBID. So we work with Korean companies, with Korean Exim Bank and others, really to try and uh, help Korean companies invest in our countries of operations in a wide variety of sectors. Korea has been particularly strong in Turkey, in Hungary, in Romania, but I see opportunities now for Korea also in Georgia and in Egypt, financing with EBRD as well. That's part of the reason I'm here in Korea at the moment. Mm. Can you tell us more about the key funds and projects that Korea is involved in? One of the areas that Korea has been very strong in is our Green Cities program. Now, this is a program where we're trying to help some of the capital cities particularly of the countries we're involved in, develop plans for more sustainable investment, whether it's in water supply, wastewater, uh, public transport, heating, lighting, all of these things where they need to move to a more sustainable green uh, approach. And Korea has, uh, of course, made major advances in that area. So it helps finance some of these green city action plans. 
This is where a capital city or any other city puts together a plan for what it wants to do to have these sustainable investments work and what sort of uh, reforms it will to undertake. After receiving those plans, EBRD then finances on the basis of those plans. So that's a big area of Korean help. A second area that Korea has taken interest in is women in business. Yeah. A big issue for, uh, for all of us working in yes. many of these countries is that very good female entrepreneurs find it very difficult to access finance uh, compared with men, uh, male entrepreneurs. So we started this women in business program in Turkey uh, some years ago because we noticed there were a number of female entrepreneurs who couldn't access the Turkish banking uh, system. And Turkish banks realized this and came to us and we t analyzed the problem together. We found one of the problems was uh, Turkish female entrepreneurs were being asked for collateral on their loans, which was in physical assets, mm. physical assets like housing. Mm. Who owns the physical assets and housing? Men do. So the women couldn't exactly get the loans. So we turned the whole approach around by the, with the banks to lend on the basis of revenue streams from the actual loans. And that allowed a lot of women to get access uh, to finance. So we now have women in business programs. Some of them are supported by Korea. And a third area would be local currency financing, where Korea has been really supportive because this whole question of trying to make the SMEs uh, function without needing foreign exchange financing. They earn their revenues, most of the small and medium-sized enterprises, in local currency. To have them borrow in foreign currency means they're running a risk all the time of a mismatch between uh, the two. And so we have started doing a lot of local currency lending. And Korea has been very supportive of that as well. So three big areas, but yeah. there are others, knowledge sharing and others which we can talk about, where Korea has been really strong. I heard um, Korea was the first country you visited um, when you got re-elected as the president of the EBRD. Was that a coincidence or was there a reason? There's always good reason. I think the particular reason at that time was that we had some good uh, ideas for donor financing that we want to discuss with Korea, some of the things I just mentioned. Right. And so it was high time I came and had a discussion about that. But I also wanted to move on one other further area with Korea, which is I think a lot of our countries of operations are really interested in the Korean development experience. Mm. Because as a development economist myself, I look back to the early 1960s. And if you look back then and you compare Korea, Thailand, India, and Ghana, they're all actually at the same point in the, but if you look at them now, yeah. Korea is easily the most advanced uh, nation. What happened? Mm. How did it change so fast? How did it transform itself economically and politically? Because we're trying to help with democratic transformation as well, and Korea has done that. So Korea is a very important uh, learning place for people in development like me. And I wanted to use the idea of um, some of the financing Korea was giving, some of the knowledge sharing, to try and actually help other countries' operations in EBRD learn from the Korea experience. So that's why I want to kick that whole debate off. And we've moved forward on that ever since. Mm. Can you share the purpose of this particular visit? Yeah, I think it's um, very much coming to the end of my time uh, as uh, EBRD president. And so we are discussing the future strategy of the bank. We are going to be approving our new strategy in May next year at the London annual meeting, which will be my last annual meeting. We have some very interesting ideas for how we can improve quality and quantity in the countries where we're currently working. Korea represents Egypt on our board, and so there's also a discussion about whether we should do more in the Middle East itself. Mm. Uh, you know, countries like Algeria or Libya coming on as well, Iraq maybe. And then there's a third issue about the whole question of should EBRD expand gradually, incrementally, into sub-Saharan Africa, and Korea has been very interested in that as well. So there's a lot of strategic stuff to discuss with Korea, and then there are the business uh, issues, the donor financing issues, the knowledge sharing issues. That's great. Um, how did your meeting with um, Deputy Prime Minister Hong Nam Gi go? It went really well. Um, so we met for the first time just back in April only, and uh, you know today um, was my second meeting with him, very warm, very close. We had a really good discussion about the future, uh, EBRD's future, about various investment summits that we've got coming up, for example, one on Central Asia next uh, June next year. I hope very much Korean business will take part in that and government as well. We also talked about uh, the need for doing more, I think, uh, in certain areas like green economy, which he's been very supportive of, women in business. 
so there's a lot to cover. Um, we overran, uh, the meeting overran by nearly double the time because it was such a good meeting as well. Mm. You've mentioned briefly about Korea's role transitioning from mm -hmm. receiver of economic aid from, to now a giver of economic aid. And I was wondering if you thought, you know, there's more that Korea could do and what would that be? I always think there's more that can be done. I think Korea's development story is an intriguing and fascinating one. So I would encourage Korea to talk more about it. It really is quite a sort of important thing to do. And I, I would also highlight certain aspects of the Korean transformation story. Mm -hmm. So for example, the Korean uh, planning board, that is economic planning board that existed since the 60s. I don't think many people realize quite how much that institution did to build the case for economic reform, to push for financial mobilization, to push the whole uh, export orientation of the Korean economy and the focus on private sector investment and building up this relationship between the business houses and government and so on. I don't think people are aware of that. Yeah. It's a fundamental institutional uh, success story that would be of great interest. Um, whenever people hear the words planning board, they immediately think, oh, that's an old style, sort of rather socialist model of development. Actually, the Korean planning board was anything but. It was actually a real promoter of the export-oriented, outward orientation success story that Korea has become. So highlighting examples like that mm -hmm. on stage, mm -hmm. very publicly, I think is the next stage of telling the world about Korea and how it's changed and how it can help other countries change. Um, one of the areas that, that the bank focuses on is knowledge sharing. Can you tell us more about what you mean by knowledge sharing? It's, it's a wonderful term that many people can understand in different ways. So your, absolutely, your question is spot on, because what we really mean by it is in the minds and experiences of every single EBRD staff member, there is knowledge gained over many, many years of involvement with the country's of operations. And yet, we as an organization, like many others, have never really put it all together. Now, as it happens, again, Korea is a country which has done quite a lot of this through its think tanks in particular. And so we want to work with Keksim Bank, of course, but also Korean Development Institute, to actually try and work up a way of putting this together, creating what we call a community of practice mm. in the BRD, where the people who really you know, have these fundamental insights into how this knowledge can be shared and, and, made, and made useful for all of our countries' operations, how that can be done. What's the actual process for doing that? Uh, from turning what's in every, several people's minds into something that actually can be shared very easily. And uh, we've been very lucky to have the support of Korea in a number of areas. I mean, interesting area, I think, actually, to think about is the PPPs area, where EBRD Actually, we're, we're a market leader in public-private public, part, public private partnerships. But again, that knowledge has never been put into one place and curated properly so we can actually offer a country like Kazakhstan that's going down the PPV route all the learning that we have together. And get the work done by KDI, Korean Development Institute, on this for us mm. showed that actually there is a way of doing this, actually putting this knowledge together. They did a really good report on this. So more of those sorts of ideas, I think, of putting these things together in a systematic way, that's what we mean, essentially, mm -hmm. by knowledge sharing. Yeah. Um, what are the current projects that the, uh, the Korean companies and the EBRD are working together on? And what impact are you expecting from the projects? I would say one example would be in Georgia in the hydroelectric sector. I think it's really exciting because there are opportunities in Georgia. Or Georgia doesn't have any oil, for example but it has water and it has the potential to supply hydroelectricity, not mm -hmm. just for its own economy, but for neighbors like Turkey, uh, Armenia, Azerbaijan as well. So we would like to get more Korean companies involved in the Georgian hydroelectric market, one example. I would like to get more Korean companies involved in PPPs because you have a lot of experience of PPPs in Korea. We've done a lot of work in Turkey on PPPs, now Central Asia is very open on PPPs. We have a Korean company involved with us in the Almaty Ring Road in Kazakhstan. That's the first major public-private partnership project in the whole of Central Asia. If that's successful, it looks like it will be, 
then I think the market opens up in Central Asia for PPPs. Again, Korean companies would have a good head start there. So these are some examples of where I think we can see more working together. So the EBRD has been on the um, global forefront of the world denuclearization. Um, what is the bank's ambition on that front? Well, this is uh, one of those unique parts of our mandate. Because of where we started our work in the former communist bloc, uh, nuclear decommissioning was always part of our original mandate. You won't find it in any other of the multilateral mm. banks' mandates at all. That's why, because of our specific geographical focus when we mm. started. And I think we've made a major contribution to nuclear decommissioning. I would encourage anyone to look at what has been done in Chernobyl. I think I'm old enough to remember what happened in 1986, uh, this awful accident, and mm. how it impacted on the lives of the workers, of course, at the site, but also all the surrounding areas in Ukraine, in Belarus, but also throughout Europe and how it affected uh, everyone. And we have worked really, really hard at DBID. We've been both uh, managing the financing of the cleanup, but also providing a lot of technical uh, expertise during it. You know, we have spent 715 uh, million euros, I think, of our own money, mm. uh, EBID's financing, uh, in putting this together. We've also managed the money of others, including Korea, who've made contributions to this uh, great cleanup. We have now this wonderful safe confinement. I don't know if you've ever seen this wonderful video of the going over the original nuclear site that protects it for 100 years now. Mm. Uh, and the next bit we're working on is a spent uh, nuclear fuel that has to be worked on and cleaned up as well. It is an extraordinary project in its own right, but it, I feel it's uh, a project which has benefits not just for Ukraine, of course for Ukraine, but actually for the world uh, because of the impact it had across many countries. And I'm hoping we're going to be doing some more nuclear decommissioning work in Central Asia now as well um, with Uzbekistan and other mm. countries too. There's a lot of that work still to do. Um, so I think this is an area where everybody will stay strong for coming you know, a decade or two. We've heard that North Korea is keen to join the EBRD. Uh, what's your take on North Korea joining the bank? Well, North Korea has not applied to join the EBID, in case anyone thinks they have. They haven't applied. Mm -hmm. For North Korea to join the EBID, it would first need to join the IMF, mm. because as a non-European country under our constitution, uh, it can only join if it's already a member of the IMF. Secondly, I presume if North Korea was going to join in future, it would want to join on the basis of being a country of operations of the EBID. Uh, for that, uh, under our constitution, it needs to move towards uh, democracy, at least. Of course, we have many countries on the path to democracy. Mm. Uh, they have not all, all arrived yet, but it needs to at least make the moves towards that for it to be eligible. So there's quite a long way to go before it meets the conditions of membership and the conditions of uh, being a country of operations. Moreover, if to be a country of operations would require us to amend our um, first article because at the moment, geographically, North Korea doesn't fall within the geography that EBRD can operate in. Mm. That has been amended four times before, so it's not unusual for it to be amended. But that also would need to happen as well. So there's quite a long way to go before we think in those terms of membership right. or operations. Right. Are there any other conditions that it needs to fulfill, like denuclearization? Or? No, I think what would happen um, in, a, in a country, any country that uh, becomes a country of operations, the first thing that happens normally is a full assessment of the needs of that country. What, where can we add value, mm -hmm. particularly, and uh, countries that have had nuclear um, sites before, as I said earlier, we have been involved in decommissioning as well. So that could be part of it. Mm. But I think we shouldn't jump the hurdle before the first hurdle, which is, you know, it's not even a member of the IMF, so it can't at the moment even join the EBRD until it does that. I presume North Korea's engagement with EBRD or the World Bank or the Asian Development Bank or the IMF would have to be part of some broader strategy of engagement with the multilateral world. Mm. Uh, and I don't think it's just going to be about EBRD. I think it's going to be about the whole engagement across mm. the piece. Mm. You've been talking about green economy transition. Um, what do you mean by that? And what are you doing on that front? So we do a number of things under the umbrella of the green economy transition. I mean, first of all, we set ourselves a target that 40% of all our investments 
uh, by 2020 will be in the green economy area. What do we do? A number of things. First of all, we're probably the biggest financier of renewables projects amongst the multilateral banks, solar, wind, biomass, all these things. Um, there's a very famous uh, solar park in Egypt called Benban. Mm. We have been the biggest financier of that. It's currently the biggest solar park in Africa. Probably will end up as the biggest solar park in the world. A second part of what we do is to try to make companies much more energy efficient as well. A few years ago, companies would say that the technology required to become more energy efficient is just too costly. Now, the payback period for that technology is much quicker mm -hmm. and cheaper, and therefore it's really worth investing in it. So we've shown these companies that they can be both more profitable and cut their energy costs, and therefore do provide a benefit to the climate as well by adopting these technologies. Yeah. And we've done that directly or through the local banking system as well. And the third area that's very important, if you think of the post-communist countries, these were some of the most energy intensive countries in the world and still are. So there's been a lot of investment in residential buildings, in uh, public buildings, uh, to really make them much more energy efficient. That has been very, very popular uh, because it's brought down the energy costs of the consumers of course, and that's made them much happier because their energy bills are much reduced. But it's also, again, contributed to helping with the climate situation. But we don't just stop there. We also work on the, um, on the bond market. So we are the first institution ever to have released a climate resilience bond yeah. just a few weeks ago in September. This is a great innovation. Uh, and we hope to do more of that sort of thing as well going forward. So uh, there's a number of areas where we're working on this sort of thing. But yeah, I'm very proud of our work on green economy uh, mm. and mm. So proud of career support for it as well. Mm. What are the future tasks uh, you're planning for the EBRD? Well, I think the future is uh, one of great opportunity, but also great challenge. We have the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals. We have the Paris Agreement on climate change. These are enormous uh, tasks ahead. The good news is that the Sustainable Development Goals that have now been agreed, they're for every country, not just for the poorest countries, for every country. And they are more in the economic area than the, pre, the, the old goals, the Millennium Development Goals. So they have things like infrastructure, energy and so on. And therefore, EBRD, I believe, in the recent years, has moved to the centre of the development stage not just doing things on the side, but on the right in the center. And therefore the private sector business model, because you can't achieve these goals with just public sector financing, grant aid. You need private sector financing, you need private sector delivery, you need the EBRD in yeah. my view. And I think the EBRD has become, if I may say so, the indispensable multilateral going forward, because its business model is now geared very strongly to helping to deliver the sustainable development goals. That's a challenge it's also an opportunity. And I hope the shareholders will seize this opportunity so the EBRD can make an even greater contribution to achieving the SDGs. Right. Well, thank you very much for talking to us today. Um, we look forward to your success in the, the remaining months thank as you the very president much. of the EBRD. Thank you so much. Thank you.